notice that we have some selected resources up here that are available for checkout if you're possibly here for a class or wanting to do additional research on this and similar topics. Uh, I'll ask that as we engage in our conversation, we have a respectful dialogue whether or not you agree with every single thing that you hear in this session. Again, we just want to have the opportunity to exchange ideas and learn from each other. So, next week, we'll actually be having Clarence Moriwaki, who will be coming to talk about um, Japanese exclusion um, and Executive Order 9066 and, um, and his experiences and his family's experiences on Baden Bridge Island. So that will be in this room, um, but today I want you to get, join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dave Ellenwood, one of my colleagues, who will be joining us today as we talk about Instagram and other social media, McGraw-Hill and Fox News, and the problem of commodifying information. I'll turn it over to Thank Dave, who will be starting in just so close here. a moment. Yes. I don't know. Is there e eating allowed in here or not? So we don't have eating in this room, okay. unfortunately. Thank you. All right. Okay. So just a moment. All right, we're going to have. Oh, there's. Apologies for this. We had it all ready to go, and then something happened. Mm -hmm. Welcome everyone again. Thank you all for coming. It's really great to have you all here. Again, my name is Dave Ellenwood and I'm a librarian here at Central. And uh, so we're going to be talking about commodifying information today. I wrote a more intriguing um, title than actually we're going to uh, be focusing on today just to get you all in the room. I'm not going to be talking entirely just about the problems of commodifying information, but we're going to be just kind of thinking about the process, the benefits, uh, the drawbacks of commodifying information overall. So, um, is that fake news? I don't know, yeah? Can you, what is, what is commodifying? We're gonna get there. Okay. We're gonna define that in a minute. Um, we'll start, I wanna just talk about the goals real quick of what we're gonna do in the next 43 minutes. So first we're gonna identify the benefits uh, and drawbacks of commodifying information. Uh, then we're going to envision our ideal information economy. And then at the end, kind of do a little action item of brainstorming ideas for getting information, uh, getting the information economy that we want. So that's the kind of overall goals. And to achieve this, we're going to do some, I'm going to set up uh, just some framing of the topic, do some definitions, and then we are going to do some small group discussion, report out these kind of things. Sound good? Okay, cool. So let's first talk about the stakes um, and why this topic is important. So to define the information economy, right? the information economy um, is the production and circulation of information that we use in our daily lives. Right? So the production and circulation of information that we use in our daily lives. And the information economy touches all of our lives both personally, in our academic work, in our professional lives, right? All, all of us are kind of influenced by the uh, information economy. And so we've got these several uh, images and symbols up here on the board and are on the screen. So starting from the left-hand side, McGraw-Hill. Can anyone tell me what McGraw-Hill is? Does anyone know what that is? Publisher. Yeah. It's a publisher. What kind of publishing do they do? Uh, I think partly they emphasize like academic work, but yep. I'm not, maybe not exclusively. So specifically they do textbooks. Yeah. That's their main um, market, right? So textbooks are part of the information economy. Second here we have an image. What's that image? Instagram. Instagram. We're all familiar with that, right? And Instagram is a social media site that we go to to uh, post pictures of ourselves, our family, friends, our dogs, whatever you're into, right? Place to share information and kind of have fun. Uh, next we have a little image of it's the television emoji. <laughs> uh, and that is signifying sort of TV news and entertainment, right? A place that we go to get um, uh, visual entertainment and news. And then 
uh, there's an image of a, uh, a newspaper, print news, right, print media. Any other things that people would can think of that are part of the information economy and part of our daily lives of information that are not represented up there? Yeah, like Facebook. Facebook, yeah. So other social media sites, it's a big one. The internet in general. Internet in general, exactly, yeah. Anything else? That's good. Okay. So, um, so we're seeing a lot of problems in this current moment uh, in the information economy. A lot of problems and tensions. Right? It's not just like a happy-go-lucky world that we're um, participating in right now. And as a librarian, and my colleagues uh, along with me will notice that like we're kind of well seated to see a, a lot of these problems across many of these different areas. So, starting with textbooks, how many people have had like a really expensive textbook before? What's the most? Just if you can shout it out, like what's the most expensive textbook that you've had? One hundred and fifty bucks. One hundred and fifty bucks. Gosh, yeah. For one quarter textbook. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You want to say? Two hundred something. Two hundred something. It's for Spanish, but it's for the three quarters. Okay. So that's at least you got it over three quarters. But, <laughs> then, but then I have to buy the coding. Like they have a specific website for the class. Yes. So we have to buy the code for that, but it's only for like for like quarter, which is I have to buy it for three quarters. Oh, that's wow. a lot. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah, so I did like a little survey of the bookstore a few quarters ago, and the most expensive textbook in there at the time was over $300 for a science textbook for one quarter, right? So there's a problem and attention there, right? If we want to pay our rent and buy food for ourselves, there's competing interests when we're trying to get an education, right? Okay, Instagram. As much as it's a fun place to go, right? Has anyone had this experience? I had this experience very recently where I was on Instagram, and I was talking about, randomly about this, uh, um, this health drink that I wanted to get. And then a couple hours later, that health drink popped up in my ads, which I find super creepy, right? And I think a lot of people do, not everybody, but it's, it's kind of a creepy thing to have happen, right? So targeted advertising is a weird tension that's in our information economy right now. Um, in the news world, Right? So there's a lot of problems happening in the news world. We hear this term fake news all the time, right? Disinformation, these kinds of things. There is a trend happening right now, um, and it's complex. There's a lot going on, but part of it is an economic, there's an economic dimension to it, um, where the trust in news is, is going down. And we can kind of see that as librarians, too, in our positions, like people are like, what, which, which news source do I go to, to that I can trust? And it's just less clear than it has been in, uh, before, right? And so this is a chart where we can see different sort of groups, political and otherwise, broken down by, um, uh, so you can see like in the, all the pink lines are people who's over the last 10 years uh, have decreased their trust in media, right? So independents are up to 75% decrease right? Republicans 94%. Liberals almost half. So, um, yeah, so we're seeing that there's this kind of shake up here, right? And there's, there's a, an economic dimension to that. This other side is more about like, do you, do you expect uh, to get better? Do you expect the situation to get better? And people are more rosy about that. They're, they're like, oh, it, might, it might actually get better. But, okay. Oh, I cannot figure out the direction. Okay, and then the last thing I'll say to kind of frame this is um, a little bit more personal. So, uh, going back to the, the crash of 2008 and 2000, uh, 2007, 2008, um, is kind of the root of where I find this topic very interesting and, and worth talking about. So, crash of 2007, 2008 was the biggest crash in the US since the Great Depression, right? Huge. Uh, implications for myself. I was just out of college. I, it was very hard to find work. I was trying to work in nonprofits. It kind of pushed me to go to grad to graduate school faster to become a librarian um, than I probably would have if I had found work in nonprofits. Um, and yeah, so it was just like a big mess, right? And there was also a big response to 
to that mess. And this is a picture of Occupy Wall Street, right? It's in Crowley Park, New York City. Um, also, side note, the COSIs come out of Occupy Seattle, right? So these conversations started at the encampment right out here, right? Um, so, so people started, were upset about the economy and how it was impacting them on, in their daily lives. And they started asking big questions about it. And you know, since it was impacting me and my community and the most vulnerable in my community the most, um, I started asking big questions. And I started grad school like right after that in librarianship. And so big questions have been on my mind about, um, about information and how it works economically from, from there, right? And you know, even people, so as part of Occupy Wall Street, people were coming up with really wild ideas, right? So they were like, why don't we just pool our books together and then circulate them for free? Like some completely new idea, right? <laughs> Bad joke, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so this is one of the reasons that I want us to ask like a really big question, and that's, um, we'll come back to this in a second. So the, the overarching question that we're kind of thinking about today is, should we as a society commodify information? That's our overarching question. Okay, so what is a commodity? Just so we're all on the same page. Um, so commodities are anything that can be bought and sold on markets. What are some examples of commodities? Food. Food, yes. Yep. Anything else? Oral and petroleum products. Yep, oil and petroleum products are commodities. Labor. Labor. Yep, labor is bought and sold on the market. Precious metals. Precious metals, yep. Any information ones that y'all can think of? Information commodities? My demographic information on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> exactly, okay, this is a great one. This is a great one, right? Because, okay, that leads into the next question, or the next little segment here is, how, uh, to commod how do we define commodifying something? So to commodify something is to take something that was previously not sold on a market and put it on a market to be bought and sold, right? And so, for example, Kimberly's you know, demographic information, and it goes deeper than that on, on our social media, right? So things that were previously not commodified were like, you know, if Mahim and I were to like have a conversation in our Facebook Messenger about whatever, um, that goes into our personal psychological profiles that are constructed by social media companies and sold to advertisers so that they can do that direct advertising where they can get me that that really great uh, health drink. Lit. So I'd say our attention yeah. is a commodity. Yep. What was it? Our attention. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's been our, our attention as a commodity previously has, was there, right? Like newspapers sell, ad, had advertisements that you know, your attention, but um, more and more of our time gets commodified through social media and all these different things, right? Okay, so those are the stakes and, and some definitions. So let's start with breaking up into some groups, and uh, I want to break it up into kind of two segments. So let's have, let's, how many people do we have? Um, how about, Okay, we're gonna go, the line is gonna be straight through here to Lynn. Uh, this is gonna be side A, and that's gonna be side B. So side A is going to talk together about what are the benefits of commodifying information? Why do we want to do this? Why is this, why is this a good thing to do? And then side B is gonna talk about the problems that arise from commodifying information. And so write them down and then we'll do a little report out. Let's give you a Like benefit for me, 
but then like you know when it gets you know put in like different place at the commodity it could you know lead to problems you know for example i think some years ago like target or you know um, walmart like you know started um, giving out like uh, dating products to you know women who then know over like you know purchasing you know um, uh, maternity, you know, stuff, and you know, sometimes you know, like those things, people don't want to disclose to you know their family and stuff. So you know, uh, I think it depends on the context. But like, for example, like health information to you know, hospitals, you know, privacy. Yeah, but also like you know, if I if, if I get to in a different state, you know, I would rather you know the hospital there has some information you know, than than not have that. But the, the fact that information exists doesn't make it a commodity. It's why it's commodified. So that, like your health record isn't a commodity until it's sold to some right. company to advertise back to you based on what you they think you right my buy yes. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you more options mm -hmm. than benefit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like things that you don't know you need but you know you might buy actually health care. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I see one problem like with um, what it had to do with, yeah, yeah, news. If news is commodified as a product to be sold, then different values will go into that information than if it's just being produced to teach people something. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a you know pretty negative form. Uh, uh, Problem mm -hmm. with, with with news as being commodified. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, now we have infotainment. Mm -hmm. It's not being produced primarily to teach people something. It's produced to sell stuff. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Yeah. Oh, there yeah. used to be something called. Do you know about this? The fairness doctrine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fairness doctrine said that. So. Um, mm -hmm. TV networks had access to the airwaves, which belong, which are public, um, and the trade-off for that was you get access to the airwaves, but you have to produce produce information and um, relatively neutral information, and that was the known as the fairness doctrine. I don't have enough information background to know like exactly how that broke down, but the the norm is no longer. Yeah. That and so you have you can have like a Fox News that is um, and and the other news networks that are are very much about um, infotainment, keeping eyes and selling advertising. So and and our news cycles are driven by keeping people engaged rather than informed. Can I add one little thing? A important part of the fairness not can get her from the word fairness. It was not okay to just present one point of view. Whereas now, MSNBC, all the major uh, news or infotainment news stations, they don't even have to worry about like presenting difference. It, it's, it's, it's horrendous. Presenting, presenting with some balance. Yeah, balance. Of course, then you have to find what is balance. But there's not even often an attempt to do that. I think that, like, you know, part of the problem, you know, that comes from having a mindset of using it or, like, you know, selling information as a commodity is, like, then whatever decisions you make are driven by profit and loss. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, that's what dictates what you are going to put out instead of, like, you know, what is, you know, truth or, like, you know, worthy of, you know, being put out. So that's, like, a meta problem that comes, you know, like, in the system, you know, yeah. when you start to modify information. Yeah, it's called capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, one of the benefits, you know, like, would you, like, call, like, you know, email services as, like, you know, a commodity? Sure. But that's not, like, commodifying information unless they, like, sell or, like, you know, use your information in, in some way. Yeah, which I think is happening. Mm -hmm. That's right. why... That's why it gives us all free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are the commodity. Our information is the commodity, right? It's not that we're paying for Google services. They're extracting our, mm -hmm. our like psychological profiles <laughs> so to, to advertise to us. So yeah, like we get a benefit out of that. So there's a positive there, and we don't, you know, we get some business for a service. Right? I'd like to hear from you two. You never really said anything. Yeah. Um, 
Those companies could then commodify it. That's yeah, right. yeah, sell it. Yeah, they sell it. Um, you know, another information is just like commodified with your cardiometric information. You know, um, so we like you know what the what the what is that? D DMV. You know, they can like you know they can sell slash give information to eyes. You know, which they have been doing in Seattle, especially you know with people who they think are undocumented. Um, but um, like they have all that information, and you know that could be given to any potential, you know, company who's interested in targeting, you know, people of a certain age group, gender, race, you know, social background, identity. I'm not sure. Well, yeah. that would be a question in my in my mind as to whether like the DMV is is allowed to actually sell that information to a private company. I, I, I I'm not so sure about that. But there's still problems with privacy. People can steal information. Well, and I think what sometimes happens is there's information that's part of the public record. Yeah. And now it's so easy to harvest that information for a company to take that information right. and then process it in yeah. some way. And that makes it accessible and useful and then sell it back. Yeah. And that, that, like in thinking about the census information, they, there used to be, like the government printing office used to publish statistical guides, and now that's been shifted over to private companies. Do then. Uh, well, I'm just going to let you know we have about a yeah. minute of chat, yeah. and then we can come back to this. That's your minute. Are you all feel <laughs> ready to like record out a little bit? Yes, yeah, yeah. okay. I, I want to hear from you. Okay, let's hear. So in terms of the government tool, well, well, mm -hmm. um, one thing that comes out from that in my mind was the border registration information. Like, if you are border registration. Voter registration. Voting 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 registration. registration. Yeah. Oh, voting. Because the, the, uh, the address of voters are actually public information. Mm. If you know the last name or her first name, yeah. you can wow. just type it down, then you can find the address. I know, right. actually. Right. So, which is real scary. Yeah. And also, one of the benefits, I think, would be like Netflix. They can like recommend some videos or clips yeah. that I'd be interested in, which is. Uh, based on my preference, which is great for me. But also it uh, brings to, it leads to the problem which is selective bias. Because I'll watch only one kind of truth. Like for example, I'll, I'm a big fan of American Center Comedy, but then I'll watch only one, one certain uh, ethnic person's comedy has very certain content, which is not really made my sense of humor diverse and also it has actual other information about politics and uh, social issues and their point of view might have the same view that leads my conclusions to the same view as the presenters. Yeah. But I'm not sure that's, that's the result of 
information being commodified. You're choosing to watch only that one. So then if you're giving, you know, if you're being given only those things, you know, which is coming from, you know, your information getting halted, you know, then there is no way for, like, it becomes really hard to, like, not choose it, you know, like, if I give you, like, five things to read, and you're like, no, 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 I want to get to six things, it's like somewhere else. Like, yeah, because they're still trying to sell you more and more stuff, yeah. that's the yeah. commodity. Yeah. Right. All right, so, oh, did you have another thing? To... No. Okay, okay. Let's come back to the big group. Look like some really good conversations happening at each table. So let's just start out by starting with this group over here. Y'all were group A, so you know what was up. <laughs> there were only two options. Oh, uh, yeah. So. Um, so we'll start with kind of a little bit of a report out about what are the benefits of commodifying information that you all identify. Me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we felt like we had possibly the harder job and just had to like twist a lot of negatives into <laughs> positives, right? Um, but here are some of the things that we came up with. So um, personalized advertising means that small businesses can focus their limited advertising funds toward folks that they know are interested in their product, right? Um, and don't have to try to get millions of dollars for like a, a spot for the Super Bowl or something like that, right? Um, that also, the personalized advertising can also mean that it's really efficient to find things. Um, one example that I, that I gave was I was looking for a gift for my friend and I didn't really know what to get her. And I was searching for things that she liked, things that were in my budget, things that were in the area, and then like the next day Instagram showed me the perfect thing. Um, whether or not, yeah, and so I didn't have to continue searching for that information because it was given to me. Um, another positive is that people can get paid for their work, right? I mean, outside of textbooks, which sometimes just rearrange chapters and then charge you again, um, but thinking about information that's in like books and uh, magazines, and people have dedicated a lot of time and energy to producing that, doing research, um, writing, getting it edited, and they deserve to be compensated for their labor. Um, we had a really great comment about the possibility of human connection and common interests, like um, with an app like Meetup, right? Like it's getting all of that demographic information and they're getting their money back somehow, probably by giving you ads. But in return, you are getting um, to meet folks that you wouldn't normally, normally get to. Um, and kind of in line with getting paid for your work, it can incentivize people to create new things um, because they know that there's an avenue for compensation. Awesome. That's a good robust list, you guys. You bet the challenge. We scraped it together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, group B. What problems, and you can, I know you all were talking about some of the benefits too, so feel free to speak to all of that in your report out. Okay. Who's going to do it? I'll say a couple things and then you guys. Yeah. Chime in because we didn't organize ourselves around who was going to be for that. So we talked a little bit about when um, the imbalance that can happen in news when it when there, it is um, money driven rather than um, where the motivation is to make money rather than to inform people um, and that things can get really bias one direction or the other. Um, remind me what, we, what else we talked about, privacy. Mm -hmm. um, there can be a conflict between individuals' um, need or desire, um, or preference for privacy versus companies wanting to use their information in ways that they might not um, prefer. They like some, you know, security related, like not like privacy, but like physical safety, security. You know, for example, if the DMV starts, you know, commodifying information, they give it like now to ICE. You know, like when asked, you know, for people who are activists or you know who are undocumented. But if they start, you know, commodifying information, like you know, it, it could lead to really like physical safety. You know, from With surveillance. Yeah, surveillance. Yeah. Yeah. Crack down on dissidents or whatever. Yeah. And I think we also briefly talked about how it's like based on context. So you know, like I. 
like if there is if my health record is commodified, mm -hmm. and which means that you know if I'm in a different state, a hospital might be able to use it. Yeah. Sure, you know, but then it might be commodified to an entity which I have no control over, yeah. and then they can use that information in whatever they like. So it's like hard to you know like draw that line between or what is like okay with being commodified and what is not because you know once it gets commodified you have very little control over how it's going to be used yeah. so that's like the challenge of figuring out um, like how do you go about this yeah, i want to add something which i mentioned in the group is that, and i didn't say it this way but i think there's a difference between collecting information and commodifying mm -hmm. because yes government agencies collect information like you know things that are in the public domain but it's only commodified yeah. when someone else gets control of it and use it to sell it as a product. Yeah. But yeah, I agree with you. It's hard to know where one, you know, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Well, there are a lot of reports of government and corporate entities yeah, partnering to, yeah. yeah. And uh, we, we talked a little bit about access, because yeah. the impact of that, you know, kind of briefly touched this, but you know, the impact of that is, kind of briefly touch this, but is that not everybody has access to information, and with government information, we've already paid for it. And so, um, there's a, yeah, concerns about who, who can have access to it and whether they have to pay again for it. Mm -hmm. Any last thoughts from you all? Okay. Oh, I want to just mention one thing. Yeah. Because I'm looking at your overarching question, should yeah. we as a society yeah. Commodify information. And I know the other group there, we're talking about some benefits to particular, like small businesses and something. Okay, so but there's a, sometimes there can be a conflict between what's in the interest of a small business and what's in the interest of society as a whole. I mean, I think that's more of a problem, not with the small business, but with the large corporations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like does the, I think your question is kind of like, does the, what benefits us as yeah. a society if yeah. we have to decide? Yeah, although there might be a... There's a, there's a be a conf I mean, yeah. we might think that different things would benefit us as yeah. a society. I mean, one thing that came right. up when, when Mahim mentioned health information for me was, uh, like, what are all of those 23andMe and mm -hmm. what are the name? All of those ones that, you know, you send in your DNA sample and they'll tell you your heritage and they also keep that information for like ge genetic testing and um, there's been records of them like trying to find like making DNA matches with folks who mm -hmm. um, not I wasn't thinking adoptions okay. but I was thinking like with like police and things like uh -huh. that like oh looking at like long distant distant relations of folks who uh, had sexually assaulted someone uh -huh. and left like yeah. Okay. Um, so, be, like, making those matches too, and so I think that'd be more like collection. I don't think that they're actually selling that information, but yeah. I'm not positive. Um, but that's something that they definitely. Well, they, I mean, that it. comes up with the facial recognition yeah. stuff that's that is being compiled into databases mm -hmm. and sold to like yeah. law enforcement, and Absolutely. probably it will be others where our images will be commodified and. Um, and then used to like, what if you walk into a store, not only on Instagram, but like you walk into a store and, it, and you're recognized, mm -hmm. oh, you like, you know, you're interested in potato chips, so suddenly like something happens. Yeah. 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 Are you talking about the Amazon Go stores, you know, because I think right. they do that. Are they doing that already? Yeah. What was that? The Amazon, like, they like, just like, know what you're picking up and you know, like, just like, mm -hmm. But I mean, based the on just you're walking you down the street mm -hmm. and, um, your whole environment could potentially be contextualized mm -hmm. for you so that it's not only your Instagram feed that reflects back up mm -hmm. to you um, yeah. what you like and what you want to see, but like, mm -hmm. much more. It's, it's yeah. No, I'm <laughs> sorry, I just want to say, so like, I have noticed so many times that if I am on Spotify and I enter a coffee shop, they play a song from my playlist, you know, which is like, which I've been playing or, you know, which, you know, is on my playlist, you know, and I, maybe it's a coincidence, you know, I'm paranoid and maybe they're also after me, you know, who knows. <laughs> well, I think part of it is it's hard to know, right? Yeah. It's kind of hidden. Um, okay, I want to move, these are really great discussions and like real, a lot of really good points that came up. Um, I want to just add a couple things before we move on to the next little segment. and. Um, one of the things, so two things about 
the sort of uniqueness of information as a commodity is one, it's socially produced. Information is produced, it's never individually produced, but you know, if, you, if I individually come up with some piece of information through language, right, that's already a socially produced thing, right? So it's, it's hard to say that it's an individually produced thing, information, right? And then the second part is that um, a lot of information sources are what they call non-rivalrous. It's a jargon term that means um, it can be consumed at the same time, right? So you, it's not like exclusive con consumption of a thing, right? So with an article uh, that a scholar wrote, I can read it at the same time. We can all have our separate copy and read it at the same time, right? Which is just very different than a lot of other commodities. Uh, we can't all be using this at the same time. What is the term you use? Non-rivalrous? It's called non-rivalrous. Non as from as in rivalry? Yeah, there's no rivalry on it, right? There's no similarly. I mean, air is getting is different, but in, you know, the, air was kind of a um, a good example a while back of like we're not competing over our use of air, right? And everyone can use the air, um, but so information is non-rivalrous, which means it's incredibly cheap to produce, incredibly cheap. And then if someone were to have a sort of monopoly over that and control over it then problems can arise, right? And, and one of the things that is a real problem in the information economy is um, the tendency towards monopoly and oligopoly. Does anyone know what oligopoly means? I'm pretty sure everyone's gonna know. Most people are gonna know what monopoly is. What's monopoly? Let's start with that. Just like a handful of people, like one company, like. Dominating dominating the whole market. One, yeah. one company dominating, oligopoly is a, f a few companies dominating. Yeah. And there's a real strong tendency, sco uh, communication scholars have done a lot of work on this, there's a real strong tendency in information markets towards oligopoly and monopoly, right? Yeah. And so it's across pretty much all of the information markets, we tend towards real s strong concentrations of ownership. So we know in uh, the media industry, there's five main companies that own the vast majority of, um, of, um, of our news production, right? Textbooks, here's a graph of textbooks. Um, Cengage and McGraw-Hill, Cengage 35%, McGraw-Hill 17%, Pearson 32%, like three major companies. And this com these two companies are planning to merge right now, right? They're in the process of merger. So they're going to have over 50% of the um, of the market, right? Uh, this is scholarly publishing. So if we look at just scholarly publishing in the top four or five uh, by top publishers, um, so psychology is uh, publishing over 70% of the psychology publishing goes through those top five publishers, right? So. Uh, and, and because it, uh, information is so cheap to reproduce, right? Like on the internet especially, you can just push a button and it's, and it's been recreated. Um, once you kind of set up parameters, once you set up barriers like paywalls, how many people have re hit a paywall when they go to find an article, right? And you're like, oh, I gotta pay $35 for this article, that's ridiculous. Once you set that up, you can just make so much money, right? So this one group called Elsevier, made four billion in profits in 2018, 31 percent margins, which is just unheard of. No other businesses are making that, right? It's just unheard of. So, and that's because it's so cheap, and because um, they have, they once they've developed the power to create the the barrier, the um, the, the paywall, then they that can continue their power, creating their power. Yeah. yeah well, if I was going to look into this further, which you don't have time for, they must have some proprietary ownership over those publications. That's what enables them to create a paywall, yeah. right? Yeah, What if, What that, those structures are, I don't know. Well, copyright or, yeah. I mean, but copyright is more for individuals. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot that we can get into, but um, yeah. once you have this kind of power through money, you can yeah. construct the legal scenarios that will benefit your company, right? And that's one of the other problems that arise with this, arises. Um, so other things, control of prices, when you have that kind of concentration, ideological power, things that were mentioned over here earlier, political power, surveillance, right? All these kinds of things. Um, 
Okay, if we, we have like six minutes left, we're really running out, I wish we had more time, but what I want to do is, I would love to do this activity of, now that we've kind of talked about this stuff, I would love for you all to take one of the um, post-its that I put on your table and come up to the board and place where you think right now, you know, in this short conversation, where you think our ideal econ uh, economy would be, right? So on this side of the spectrum, completely free information, right? Non-commodified information. That's all, all the way over here on this side of the spectrum. Then we come over here, completely commodified information. So this is the spectrum. Where do you want to be on here? You can go anywhere. Take your uh, post it and pop it up on the board. And we're remaining anonymous. We're not putting our names. No, yeah, you don't want to put your name. I mean, the people probably see you all. <laughs> <laughs> we all have to close our eyes. And, <laughs> and let's get on the dump. Yeah. yeah. Information, food, housing, clothing, as you know, out of the profit sphere as possible, and I think uh, that's my you know rationale towards putting free information. Cool. Anyone? Uh, go ahead. I I put my left of the middle, but right of the Mahis. So, um, and I put it there because I think that that the information that we need to be successful in society should be free, but I don't think that necessarily all information needs to be free, because I don't think that all information is necessary for people to survive and be well. Great. Does anyone from this side want to say anything? No pressure at all. <laughs> you want to say something, just real quick, why you went there? <laughs> Uh, I think everything is not about uh, worth. Uh, information uh, can be expensive, like Apple, Web. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Cool. Could, could you restate what he said? I didn't understand. Uh, my, well, my understanding of what you're saying is that there are really expensive pieces of information out there, and they should be expensive, and that's why I think he's putting that over there, right? Is that kind of getting at? Is that what you're saying? Maybe? No. Um, okay, so I want to just close out. We got two minutes. Um, and just talk about a little bit about people who are trying to change this system. So the action steps. Um, so OER, Open Education Resources, these are alternatives to textbooks. And there's a movement in academia in particular of people trying, it's like a combination of students, uh, administrators, faculty, all sorts of librarians, um, trying to get, create an alternative to really expensive textbooks. So there's been a lot of en energy and effort going into creating things that people can use in their classes instead of paying $300 for a textbook. Um, open access movement is big. It's um, basically trying to make all scholarly publishing open without a paywall, right? And recently, uh, the UC system in California just boycotted Elsevier, which we talked about it earlier, essentially broke their contract with Elsevier. They were the biggest uh, uh, client of Elsevier, and they broke their contract, and so they're boycotting. Um, so things like that are happening. Uh, alternative media is a really important 
uh, movement right now, and there are various kinds of, of alternative media. There are alternative media that is using sort of, you know, uh, ways of like selling products essentially, like, well, what's the InfoWars, y'all know what InfoWars is, <laughs> right? So, uh, so like nonprofit alternative media is, a, is an, um, is another movement, authors of color movement. So another thing we didn't mention earlier is the sort of lack of diversity that can come with the concentration of, of um, publishing. So uh, there's, there's a lot of examples of like the skewing towards white men publishing. Um, recently there was a book published that uh, was called American Dirt and it's, um, it was about the, the sort of border issue in the US and it was written by a white woman and she made a ton, six figures off of the, the initial uh, proposal and then a group of Latinx uh, authors got together and like this is really messed up, this book is kind of terrible, why is this person making so much money off of this and it pressured the Macmillan to, um, to give more to give more contracts to Latinx authors. So that's another example. Um, there's been pressure on uh, companies like Facebook to be more cyber secure and to potentially even pay users because they're using our, our data. Um, we're at the end of our time, so those are just the examples, and if you wanted to talk more about those, I'm open to it. Um, any, any quick ones that you all can think of that I didn't mention up here, like ways of People who are working towards changing our current information economy. Cool. That's pretty cool. Well, yeah. just I I have been in the alternative media. I did some radio. Nice. So I'm familiar with how hard it is being a nonprofit and not being corporate sponsored. Yeah. To really get out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so that people know there are these alternative sources of media, mm -hmm. because we, you know, we don't have the money to advertise. Mm -hmm. I mean, our budgets usually come from listeners. Mm -hmm. Particular radio station I work for was part of the Pacifica network. Mm -hmm. If you know Democracy yeah. Now, that's part of that. Yeah, we're always fundraising because when our principles we do not take corporate contributions. Yeah. So that's that's a real fight there. Cool. So let's thank Dave.